Hello and welcome to lecture two for topic 11, where we're going to be taking a look at the eras of work policy. Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to take a look at, as I said, the eras of work policy and gender. Uh, we're going to look at era one, which is known as the protective labor laws that start in the 1850s and continue to the 1960s. Uh, and then we'll look at era two, which is the era of equal opportunity laws from 1960 to the present. So let's go ahead and get started. Now in the last lecture, we were taking a look at answers to questions about why people work. Um, and how society answers the question about why people work, and in particular, why do women work, um, it can provide a gateway to understanding the corresponding um, policy. And so, it, for example, if you're asking, well, why, why are women working? And the answer is, well, women are working because there's some sort of social or economic failure um, that, you know, there's war or that women are working because that there's nobody to marry or that they are, it's a product of divorce. You know, the corresponding policy could be like, okay, women are working, but it's seen as sort of like not normal. And so we better protect the women who are working with our public policy. Um, if you ask the question, why are women Women working and the answer is well hey women are working to achieve economic opportunity and personal fulfillment just like men well then the public policy will correspond with that and it will basically say hey let's have public policy that um, uh, is focused on equal opportunity sort of treating men and women similarly um, now, when we look at these eras, we're going to see that the first era in the United States is really sort of a reflection of um, underlying assumptions that working women, that when women are working, it's somehow not normal, like something's wrong, and therefore it demands government attention, that women need to be protected within the worst workforce. But then as we see gender expectations changing and seeing women working as a you know, just an expression of personal fulfillment or economic opportunity, just the same as why men work, well, then you're going to see that public policy sort of corresponds, equal opportunity pub, uh, public policy as it relates to work sort of corresponds with those underlying assumptions. All right, so let's turn our sights to the first major policy era as it relates to work. Um, that is the protective labor laws that came about starting in the mid part of the 19th century and continued into the mid part of the 20th century. Now, um, to understand the development of the protective labor laws as it relates to gender, um, you have to think about the backdrop being the mass industrialization that was taking place starting in the United States and throughout the the, uh, the developed world, in um, you know after the Civil War in the United States in the mid part of the 1800s, um, and you know you see so you see um, with advances in um, machinery and with advances and with combustible engine and um, you know that you, you that that gets reflected in um, you know uh, the development of factories, uh, the need for coal, more need for coal, more that means more need for mining. Um, that as you're able to, um, you know, sort of mass collect cotton, then you have mass production of textiles and textile fact, uh, factories. And so, you, you know, you really see this, uh, you know, boom of industrialization in the United States, people leaving rural areas to come get jobs, um, you know, in these, in these factories that are being developed. Um, and there were a lot of concerns about the impact that industrialization and working in factories had on workers. Um, you know, reformers, you know, looked at the dangers of mining, black lung, the dangers of working in textile factories, um, you know, the, the dust that's produced from the cotton. And, uh, you know, and uh, reformers and progressives who were really concerned about the impact that this had on workers, um, that they basically were saying, look, um, a you know, these industries are dangerous and we need protective labor laws for everybody in the United States, um, that we need protective labor laws that make sure that the working conditions are safe, um, that it limits the number of hours that you work um, because these are dangerous endeavors. Um, and it also, you know, that basically since these are dangerous endeavors, you need to be paid a certain amount. And, and so there was a move throughout the United States, not just, you know, to have you know, productive labor laws for everybody um, uh, working in these dangerous conditions. 
And so uh, some of the early protective labor laws didn't have anything to do with gender. They just basically had to do with limiting, um, you know, uh, protecting workers' rights and limiting the numbers of hours that they could work and the conditions that they could work in. Um, and so uh, that, uh, that, that as these um, laws begin to develop, these protective labor laws begin to develop, the question comes to the Supreme Court asking whether or not these, these laws that are in particular either demanding minimum wages or placing legal limits on um, on the number of hours that workers can work, um, the question is, well, are these laws constitutional? And that question comes to the court in a landmark case called Lochner v. New York in 1905. Um, and Lochner deals with a, um, a, the, a, a New York state law that's passed. And in that law, it basically says it, it's tailored to reducing the work hours for bakers. Um, that, you know, working in an industrial bakery with big ovens and big mixing, you know, bowls or whatever, um, that's dangerous work. It can be dangerous work. You know, one wrong move and your arm could get sort of tangled up into, you know, the, the mixing machine. Uh, and so they wanted to make sure that the workers weren't working 12 hours, 13 hours, 14 hours, because if you're tired, it's a lot more dangerous. And so New York passed a law saying that if you work in a baker, uh, if you work at an industrial bakery, you can only work 10 hour work days. Well, it seems like a good law, right? I mean, 10 hours, right? Uh, limited to 10 hours. Um, it seems like a good law, particularly to protect the workers. But uh, the, the, the concern was is that those kinds of laws were violating the liberty, the liberty of both the worker and also the, the employer. And so um, that the, the, these productive labor laws came to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in Lochner v. New York said that these kinds of laws were in fact unconstitutional, these protective labor laws. They basically said that due to the due process clause in the 14th Amendment that says that, that states can't take away your life, liberty or property without due process of law, um, that this kind of, of law saying you can only work 10 hours a day took away your liberty. That is your right to sign a contract. Um, and that is a right that is protected under the due process clause. And so they basically said that employers have a right to um, demand certain work hours from their workers and workers can say, I want to work those hours. I'm happy to work 15 hours a day, giddy up. Um, or they can say, nope, this job isn't for me and they can walk. The state can't force the employer um, to limit the hours their workers can work because workers also have the right to work as much as they want. That was the reasoning in that case. Um, and, you know, it's a reflection of sort of the laissez-faire, the free market um, capitalism at, 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 at that dominated at this view at this time period. Um, and so, you you know, initially protective labor laws for all was seen as not constitutional, violating individuals' liberty. Now, if you recall from some of our earlier lectures this semester, you're, you would, you know, remember that social feminists were very active at this, uh, at this period of time. Um, in fact, social feminists were involved in the progressive and the reformers movement. Um, for social feminists, that they really felt that women workers in particular needed special protections. If you recall, social feminists believe that women are distinctively different than men, um, that they are the more moral sex, that they are the, the gentler sex, um, that they are uh, the weaker sex, and therefore they need protection. Um, particularly if they're in the workforce, which the social feminists view it as sort of like the domain of men. Um, and so social feminists had worked for, you know, for a long time on um, trying to get pr protective labor laws uh, for women. Now, following Lochner, um, the social fem feminists um, joined forces with the progressives um, because the progressives were also for protective labor laws for all, and, but the progressives were like, okay, we're not going to be able to get protective labor laws for all, but maybe we can get them for special classes of, of people. And so they joined forces with the social feminists in order to protect um, pass protective labor laws. The thinking is, is, hey, if we, if all workers can't get special protections, let's just focus on certain workers. Let's focus on women and children. And that's what they did. 
So what's in the mind of the social feminists? What is it about their values and their ideology, their, their worldview about gender? Um, what, what, what is it about their ideology that leads them to think that women workers need special treatment? Well, for one, um, from a social feminist viewpoint, um, that they, they, they view that, um, that women should, that their, their rightful places in, 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 within the family and within in, within the home, since men or women are are different different, women are more nurturing, and therefore the role that they should play is nurturing their children and developing you know the the the, the house. Uh, and so, for the social feminists, they see that women don't choose to work, right? That their choice would be with the family and in the home. But if they end up working, they're they're sort of forced to work due to some sort of bad circumstance, something socially going wrong. And so, so from the socialist, uh, from the social feminist point of view, they're basically like when women join the workforce, it's because their husband died, they're a widower, they can't depend on their husband anymore, and so that's why they have to enter the the workforce, or that the marriage failed, and that that they're divorced, and they have no other choice to, but to enter into the workforce. And so from a social feminist point of view, they're like, well, since this is not a choice that women are making on their own, but because of these circumstances, they need protections. Um, also social feminists, because they do see women as the weaker and the, and the gentler sex, um, they view work as being harder on the bodies of women than men. Um, that there are physical differences, um, and there are physical differences between men and women. But social feminists saw these physical differences as being sort of um, something that needs to be um, taken into mind and protected. They saw them as not having the same number, of, you know, they're not as strong as men. Um, they're not able to like work a big machinery. They're not able to work in these large factories, or if they are working there, it's sort of dangerous. And so you need to protect them um, from these dangers due to these physical differences. Um, also, social feminists were concerned about the, the chronic fatigue of work, um, that chronic fatigue, working all the time can lead to bad health. And indeed, that's true. Um, whether you're a man or woman, long hours are bad for your health. Um, but from the social feminist point of view, those those that chronic fatigue that's associated with work, um, that that impacts the woman's body, could impact their reproductive capacity, and that future generations could be impacted as well. So this this is sort of the thinking for social feminists that you know that the progressives piggyback on because they're like, hey, let's get some protective labor laws passed. Um, and so from this perspective, it was that you know that that women need protections until they get back to their proper responsibilities, right? So they're almost like in the workforce temporarily until we can find a new husband or until that war is over or whatever. So really there were three major types of protective labor laws um, that provide these protections for women. Um, the first is that women can only work in certain occupations. There were certain um, occupations that were considered men-only occupations um, and that the protective labor laws basically said these were the kinds of jobs that women could not hold, the men-only occupations. Uh, what's kind of interesting, some of the men-only occupations maybe seem to make a little sense in the in, in the in the um in the context, this historical context, um, so, sort of mining and you know smelting, you know that as a process of melting whatever iron ore in order to make steel, you can kind of see from that time period that um, that would be men only occupations. Um, but sometimes these men only occupations sort of really reflected broader um, and far ranging sort of um, sexual stereotypes. Uh, so, for example, uh, women could not uh, bartend. They couldn't serve as a bellhop in a, a hotel, uh, a meter reader. They couldn't, you know, read meters around in homes, elevator operators, work in a bowling alley. Women couldn't uh, were prohibited from working in those fields as well or those uh, occupations as well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, sort of, what you know, with, with bartending and bowling alleys, I mean, I guess it's like if a woman's a bartender and it's only, a, you know, mostly men at the, the bar, that they're subject to sort of like some dangers from the sex predator men, right? So it, it kind of reflects gender stereotypes for men as well, that like when men are around women, they're going to take advantage of them. Um, same with meter readers. A woman couldn't 
go into a home alone because oh my gosh what would happen elevator operators it seems like that would be an okay op uh, occupation but no you might end up in an elevator with a man alone you know and so you know again uh the, the, these protective labor laws uh prohibited women from working in um and these certain occupations with an eye to sort of protecting women from these immoral situations, the elevator. Um, as they were also subject to certain working conditions. And so protective labor laws kind of go back to the Lochner era of sort of, you know, basically saying, okay, women can only work 10 hours a day in order to prevent, you know, the, the physical fatigue, couldn't work at night, no heavy lifting, right? No working at night, um, you know, could be that you still have have to get home take care of the kids or also working at night there's something immoral about working at night and so another category was that the subject of these certain working conditions uh, and then also that uh, women must receive a minimum wage which is really interesting and the thinking behind the minimum wage was that since women were working out of need their husband died or they that that they are divorced or they're working because men are overseas working, you know, in war, um, that you better, the society better be damn sure that women are getting a good wage um, for this because they're not choosing to be there and they've got to be able to provide for their families. Um, and so since they're working out of need, not choice, the state needs to provide a minimum wage for women. Uh, now keep in mind uh, intersectionality right that these protective labor laws protected some women I mean or maybe provided benefits with the minimum wage and reduced working hours being you know not allowed to work in certain occupations is not necessarily beneficial um, but a lot of protective labor laws excluded many women um, because a lot of women in particular women of color and women of lower class um, were um, uh, were working in the agricultural sector, working on farms, working in domestic capacity. Um, you know, I mean, you know, in the South, I mean, slavery may, may have ended after the Civil War, but still, you know, a lot of African American women were still working in the domestic realm. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that, and these protective labor laws did not apply to those women. So the protective labor laws were really more designed for white women who, I guess, had the opportunity to work in in the factories and in, 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 in the industrialized, probably, probably the industrialized North. So as states begin to pr uh, pass protective labor laws I, uh, targeted at protecting women workers, um, the question comes about, uh, in, in, about whether or not these protective labor laws are constitutional. You'll recall in Lochner that no laws limiting days to 10 hours was found unconstitutional. Uh, should the same reasoning that was in Lochner that workers have the freedom to, you know, ha ha contract freedom to figure out what kind of day work day they want in terms of the hours that they they work should that same reasoning extend to special categories of the protective labor laws for women or is it constitutional to treat women differently is it okay to have protective labor laws for women but it's unconstitutional to have those same protective um, labor laws for men well let's see what the court says so the question of the constitutionality of protective labor laws for women came to the Supreme Court in 1908 in the case Mueller versus Oregon. And this uh, case deals with the protective labor law in Oregon. Very straightforward. It prohibits women from working more than 10 hours a day. Kurt Muller, he owned a laundry. I had many female employees and he made his female employees work more than 10 hours a day, thus violating the Oregon law. Um, and so he was um, fined and he appealed the fine saying that this law, Muller in uh, the Oregon law, was in fact unconstitutional. And so the question that comes to the court are, are state laws limiting women's work week to 10 hour days constitutional? And what the Supreme Court said was, yes, it is constitutional. So even though the Lochner said those 10 hour workday laws were unconstitutional, they took a different approach when it came to uh, limiting the workday, the, the, the work hours in a day for women. 
And the reasoning was that they agreed with the social feminists. Um, that was the prevailing viewpoint at the time, uh, that women are special and they need protection. And due to the impact uh, on that, that work has on the negative impact that work has on women, that the state has a strong interest in protecting this category of, of, of worker. It's, what's kind of cool about this case too, is that Louis Brandeis, he's a justice, uh, he, he's a future justice of the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, that um, it, he was a part of the uh, team that was trying to defend these Oregon state laws. And when the Supreme Court is trying to make decisions, they read briefs that people submit to the court. And so um, future Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis submitted this brief. It's known as the Brandeis brief. Um, and what's kind of cool about it is that they used science. Usually courts would just like look at past court precedent in the ruling. But here they actually looked at scientific and social evidence to make their decision. And they prevent, they presented a bunch of scientific evidence that said that harsh working conditions harm women, could potentially harm the fetus, etc. Um, and so it's it just a, a, a little point if you're on Jeopardy, right? The importance of the Brandeis brief. Um, keep in mind that Mueller doesn't overturn Lochner. And so they base, what they basically say is that it's constitutional to treat men workers and women workers differently in the eyes of the law. So women as a special labor force in need of protection is the dominant viewpoint um, starting in the mid part of the 19th century all the way up until the 1960s. And because it's the dominant viewpoint, you know, Congress uh, establishes an agency that's focused on the task of protecting women in the workforce. It was known, it's known, it's still in existence today. It's, it, they created the, the Women's Bureau in 1920 and it was modeled after the Children's Bureau. So again, women and children in need of protection. Uh, and it's basically an, a, what, you know, it's an institutional embodiment of this special workforce view. As I said, it's still in existence today um, with a shift on a focus to equity. Um, and it's a part of the United States Department of Labor. So if you see the Women's Bureau um, today, know that that they've adopted the new viewpoint with the move towards equal opportunity in terms of labor. Um, but they, you know, it, it, it began as a reflection of the viewpoint of women needing special protections. So if you recall from earlier in the semester that we talked about the social feminists, but we also talked about the egalitarian feminists. And the egalitarian feminists were still alive and well, you know, middle of the 19th century on into the, you know, the, the beginnings in the mid, middle part of the 20th century. Um, they just didn't have the political and social power that the social feminists did. Um, and so while the socialist feminist, social feminist viewpoint prevailed until the 1960s, the egalitarian feminist viewpoint um, does doesn't fade away. It's still present. Um, it's just basically waiting for a shift in um, what's known as zeitgeist, the, a, a shift to um, a new sort of spirit of the times. That's what zeitgeist means. So while the social feminists that women are different from men really had social and cultural um, traction in, up until the 1960s, starting in the 1960s, the egalitarian feminist viewpoint gets a lot more traction. Um, and that's due to, you know, changes within our economy economy, changes within our, our, our society, and, a, and also a response to some of the ideas that are raised during the civil rights movement. So from a political and economic point of view, or from an economic point of view, um, that there was a huge economic boom um, following World War II. And so um, that, that because of that economic boom, we needed more workers. But also because of an economic boom, um, that we wanted to use that economic boom to um, actively compete with the Soviet Union. So after World War II, that there's two basic dominant world world global powers: the United States and the Soviet Union. And there was sort of a battle between, okay, who's going to join with the United States, liberal democracy, capitalism, and who's going to join with the Soviet Union? Socialism, what's known as the command economy. Um, and so we all know there's this battle between the Soviet Union and the United States that never gets 
hot directly. Um, and so making sure that all of our workers were skilled up and educated, just like um, not just men, but women as well, was seen as us getting an, a, a leg up on the Soviet Union, who actually had more gender equality, right? Um, the Soviet Union, part of the socialist philosophy is that we're all workers, right? And so the Soviet Union had, you know, women workers and women were educated. They didn't have the same gender sort of divisions. And so we wanted to be able to convene, compete. Um, there were also uh, you know, socially and culturally as well um, that, um, that you know, it's hard to maintain that women aren't up for working when they just worked their butts off during World War II. So as men were overseas, women were working in factories, creating munitions and other things, and they showed that they can do the same job as men. So there's a change in terms of thinking about women in the workforce. And then also the civil rights movements as well. As African Americans were saying that the emphasis should be on the quality of the character, not on skin color, that also remains alive. And you know that also gets picked up by feminists who are saying, let's not look at a gender, but let's look at people's ability to work and their skills and let's go with that. Hire the most qualified person, not based on their gender, but on their skills and, and, and intelligence and qualities. So era one, the era of a protective labor laws officially ends with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in particular Title VII, which um, bans discrimination on the basis of sex and employment. And so Title VII prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And keep in mind, we discussed this um, last week in education, that this is really, this is the only place in the Civil Rights Act when it was passed in 1964 that included the word sex and prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Now, just as a reminder, I know I've said this before, but I can't say it enough, um, that really Recently, in a case that became before the Supreme Court, Bostock in 2020, um, that uh, the, the Supreme Court has broadly defined what discrimination on the basis of sex and employment means. And so today, um, the, the, on the basis of sex is interpreted as including sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and so a, an employee cannot be discriminated against. They can't lose their job or not be hired because they're gay, lesbian, trans, um, non-binary, etc. Um, so the um, Title uh, Seven of the Civil Rights Act brings in the era of equal opportunity in terms of labor law. Women are no longer treated as a special category of worker, but they are viewed as part of the uh, regular workforce. Um, the individual rights of uh, workers are evaluated on, on their merits, not on their um, sex or race, or if they are evaluated on the, their sex or race, that that's a violation of federal law. Uh, keep in mind too that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was a product of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and so that is the agency or the commission within the federal government that explores um, employment discrimination, including employment discrimination based on sex. One year prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act, another law was enacted that was also a reflection of the um, era two of the Equal Employment Opportunity Laws. And um, that was that's the Equal Pay for Equal Work law that was passed in 1963. And it basically says that employers may not pay employees of one sex a lower pay rate than a pay worker of the opposite sex in jobs that require substantially similar skills, efforts, and responsibilities, okay? In other words, um, people that are doing the same job um, using the same skills need to get paid the same pay rate. Um, it ended the long practice of paying women less for the same job and um, that this law had wide support. Um, it was supported by male workers and unions because that it ended the incentive to hire cheaper female labor. And so if you could pay women less, pay women less for doing the same job, what employer wouldn't want to do that, right? Right? Because in capitalism, you're going to save money that way. Um, so, you know, um, not having equal pay laws uh, adversely impacted mail workers. And, um, and so unions got behind that, particularly at this time period, unions were um, probably predominantly, um, you know, had uh, representing male workers. And so there was broad support for this kind of, of law. Now, as many of you know, because I know several of you wrote your paper on equal pay, 
And we're going to be learning more about that um, it, for our last uh, discussion this semester. Um, the Equal Pay uh, for Equal Work law has had um, really limited impact. The impact of this law is very limited. Um, it's, it's equal work, not comparable work. So you actually have to be doing the same job, um, to get paid the same rate. But if you're doing similar jobs, sort of comparable jobs, right, then the equal pay for equal work law does not apply. And as we know that, um, that it has not, uh, this law has not effectively, um, uh, closed the, the gender pay gap and the gender pay gap, as we know, persists. Um, you're going to be exploring the gender pay gap in, in more detail in topic 12. You'll be learning about it. You're going to be learning about the causes and the consequences of it and what are some of the policy remedies that we can pursue in order to close the gap. So what are some of the contemporary issues um, that uh, are of concern to feminists as it relates to work and pay? Well, um, there are still many um, contemporary issues. Obviously, the gender pay gap is one. Um, but the other is the family, family and medical leave. Um, that one of the main issues regarding work and pay in the United States is the absence of a national paid family leave program. The United States is one of very few countries in the world that do not offer paid leave for um, families. Uh, so whether that's family leave as it relates to a birth or an adoption or family leave as it relates to taking care of a sick person in your family, um, the United States falls far behind uh, in, uh, other nations in terms of not providing any of that paid leave. Uh, the current policy in the United States is the Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA, um, that was uh, enacted during the Bill Clinton administration in 1993, and it offers 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, uh, but we have no paid leave in the United States. And in fact, only 60% of workers are even eligible for FMLA, as you'll learn in some of the articles that you're going to be reading about this week. Now, several states do have paid leave. And so while we don't have federal legislation, some states are adopting it, but Wisconsin has not adopt a fa adopted a fa family of uh, Pay, uh, of paid family leave. We don't have that in Wisconsin. And so it's really dependent upon your employer. If your employer doesn't provide fa fam paid family leave, you do not get it. Um, and just most recently, the Democrats are, you know, they're, they're trying to pass this Build Back Better Act um, that is this huge social security, uh, social safety net bill. And um, initially, uh, President Joe Biden was, when he was campaigning, he was campaigning saying that he was going to enact fam paid family leave and the Democrats couldn't get it there. Um, we had two, there were two holdout Democrats um, and uh, 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 Senator Manchin and Senator Sima from Arizona, and they do not support family leave. So that paid family leave. So that is not something that is going to be included in this bill. Um, maybe in the future, don't hold your breath. Um, you're going to be reading two articles. I didn't mean to be negative. Uh, hold your breath. It's going to happen, right? Um, but it's not going to happen in the near term. Get out there, run for office, and make sure you're voting for people. If you support fit paid family leave, um, vote for people who support fit paid family leave. Okay, I'll shut up. Um, you're going to be reading two articles this week about the benefits of paid leave. Uh, one is of, of the, the benefits of paid leave has for everyone, but in particular families of color. And the other one is the positive impact of paternity leave on men and on families. All right, thanks for paying attention and I'll talk to you again soon.